Oh, I wasn't plugged in all the way. Oh, there, there you go. Idiot. <laughs> oh, hey, we're recording. Hum. Hey, I'm Ryan. And I'm Steve. And if Ryan would have let the timer get to two minutes, it would have made my life a lot easier. But <laughs> whatever. This is 60 Cycle Hum, the guitar buying, selling, trading, mining, fixing, breaking, reviewing, playing podcast. podcast. I heard <sighs> you do it on the on the Summer Now episode. You did the intro. I did do the intro and I got it right, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, it feels good to be back, by the know, way. It's, it's the, it's, and, and of course, I caught shit for it that you were able to do it right. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we want to talk about Gibson? Yeah, they set a record or something. Gibson set a record. Studio <laughs> label? Gibson apparently is starting a record studio label company, a recording record studio. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the thing I want to talk about the most is the logo. <laughs> Oh, really? That's have what you, you, that's why you wanted to talk about it. Well, this? I'm sure we have other things we could mention about it. Let me let me find the logo for it. Uh, Gibson Records. Gibson Records. I mean, it, I there's been a lot of commentary on it on our Facebook group. Um like, you know, they're 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 going to release records for Gibson artists. You know, like right. hey, like you want to hey slash, you want to make a guitar well, rock album. So I mean, literally, we'll, their first artist we'll is, is Slash. Right. No big surprise, right? Yeah. I'm trying to find a higher resolution version of this so I can show you the problems I have with the logo. There's already a Gibson Records. Uh oh. CC to Sisti. In 1987, they released the best of Belinda Carlisle. All right, let me show you this, Steve. It doesn't look like they've released anything since then. I mean, this isn't the whole logo, but it's cropped a little bit. Uh huh. Do you see any issues that like grab your eye? What two fonts? No, no, two fonts is fine. This this is like the level of nitpicky I am as a graphic designer. That little sliver there in the B. Oh, that little black spot. Oh my gosh, it's so sloppy. As a graphic designer, like that makes my teeth hurt. And the over here. The way it connects to the O, that orange circle connects to the O. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, it makes me cringe. So you think the circle should be bigger? The circle should be ever so slightly bigger. Like the circle should not leave that little black and it should connect higher up on the inside of that O. You know, if you uh, if you would have uh, known about this, you could, yeah, have, to I you could have told you could have told Mark. I could have prevented a disaster. Oh no, they already have it committed to like a physical thing. <sighs> Wait, can you see the, the spot? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, you totally can. Oh my gosh, that bugs me so much. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> like, no one else is going to care, but all the graphic designers look at that and, like, oh no, why? Why didn't, <sighs> like, someone fix that? <sighs> um, it's just the tiniest little thing. So, they they do have an artist. And their artist is Slash. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they eventually, I'm sure they'll have Bonamassa do an EP or something, and they'll have, you know, whoever else is on their artist roster put out little records and stuff. Oh, I'm not saying little records, but, you know, they'll put out, you know, they'll put out stuff that is specific to the Gibson label. Well, so the, so the thing is my guess, anyways. You think, thing, you think the Gibson record label is going to completely take over publishing for these artists? So that's what I'm kind of confused about is, um, how does this work for, you know, it's like, like contracts and stuff. Yeah. For contracts, because I, you know, presumably um, some of these artists already, already have, have record labels. They already have deals. They probably already have other projects in the works. So is this Gibson calling it a record company or a record label or a studio, whatever they're calling it, but it's really just like, we're calling it that, but you technically haven't broken any of your other contracts, so you can do this because we're technically not the same. Like, it, like I wonder what the actual kind of like legal details are behind the scenes. Well, and the other like the this. other thing that I was I was going to put out there is, um, I don't know. My thought was, oh well, maybe like that. What they'll do because this could be interesting is. You know, say Slash has a contract with whoever he has a contract with. Everyone has a contract with uh, their own respective labels. Sure. Right? 
But, uh, you know, thinking in terms of Gibson signature artists, like there's no, like now um, Slash and Orianthi, uh, Orianthi make a super group that's really just the two of them. Right. And they're on Gibson Records. But then the issue with that, because this is what I was looking up, is Miles Kennedy, I think, is a PRS artist. Mm. So are they just going to release the music? And it's like, well, because here's, you, you here's would how assume it works. that the record label is a vehicle to promote Gibson instruments. The, the artists playing on the records are not the actual, like, star of the show. They just happen to be session musicians. The guitars are... <laughs> Are the artists on the record? That's who's signed oh to the Gibson record label. The, the, everyone else is just a gunslinger brought in to record. Like the guitars are under contract; they cannot go to other labels. But they're saying, but like, but Slash is the guitars, right? Right, like, right. I. What do you think? I mean, obviously they're going to do the obvious thing, and it's going to be Slash and Orianthi and whoever else Gibson yeah, has. Yeah, Lizzie Hale. Right, right. And- uh, and that's great. Like, yeah, great. Do that stuff. I think it'll be so much more powerful. Mark, if you're listening, JC, if you're listening, it'd be so much more powerful to use this as a platform to explore new and experimental artists, which is something that Gibson needs so deeply. Like they are in danger in the next decade or two of becoming purely nothing but a legacy brand as you know their main core legacy fan base ages out of purchasing guitars like they need fresh blood this could be a really good way to go about that like i'm not talking about picking up people that are rising stars i'm talking about picking up people that no one knows about and making them into stars like find some kid on youtube like oh that kid's a shredder Oh, that kid can really put together like a really fun pop song. Yeah. Oh, that kid's got, you know, gent uh, riffs or whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's put them in a studio with a producer, with a backing band and put them on the map with a, with Gibson guitars. Like, I mean, like you're not wrong, but I think you're, we're mostly going to see. It's not radio bankable. It's not record sales bankable, but in terms of building an audience and building a fan base and building a customer base for Gibson guitars, I think it would be much more interesting to go experimental and weird and just like, just like artist discovery angle with it. Right. But I, you know, this is a brand that I think is in a rebuilding phase. I think on the whole, I don't know my, this is my opinion. I don't, I don't, I don't really follow very many brands on social media to begin with. Right. So maybe I'm totally wrong about this, but I don't get the feeling that Gibson is particularly social media savvy. And basically in order to do what you're describing, they would have to become social media savvy. And I just don't, I just don't see that happening. I I see basically what you don't want to see is what's going to happen, which is you're going to have the slash and miles Kennedy album. You're going to have a, you're going to have known Gibson. Right products being put out as a as just an extra side thing and maybe eventually you know maybe eventually you get some stuff that kind of works like that but it'll be through i think it'll be more through those artists like i think it'll at in a best case scenario um you know slash goes to a show and he likes the opening act and then he goes back and says hey i saw this sick band you guys should sign up i think that's like a best case scenario i don't see like another fun angle would be like, it's in Nashville. They're in Nashville. Mm-hmm. There's an incredible wealth of talent there. Mm-hmm. Like put together an album that's all guns for hire, like all Nashville session players and stuff like that. You know, like like bring in people that usually go on tour to be hired for other bands and be like, hey, you know, all these people are extremely talented musicians. And it'll be like, it's, it's almost like they could pitch it like, here's this guy or here's this girl. They play for this notable artist. Here's their song. So it's like they get to, they get to push this recording. Like, Oh, here's a musician who usually plays with this huge act. Mm -hmm. Like that's the advertising. You're not listening to that huge act. You're listening to a guy who plays for that huge act. You know, there's like something marketable there and there's, you know, like 
there's a clickbaity social media kind of like a uh, PR stunt element to that sort of thing. And it's like, Hey, look, Gibson, is, Gibson is supporting oh, you say? a what kind of stunt <laughs> PR. Oh, PR stunt. What did you think I said? I thought you said like Pete Lar stunt. I'm like, who's <laughs> Pete, Pete Lar? Lar? You know, good old Pete Lar. Oh, famous, famous marketing guru. Who's in my mind? Pete Lar. <laughs> what if there is a guy yeah. named Pete Lar? And there he's really is. well known for his stunts. Right. <laughs> he's like the evil Knievel. <laughs> Pete, Pete Lar was actually, uh, but that's a good angle, was right? Actually, like Mar- the name that Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook under was right. Pete Lar, like Gibson. I'm talking to you right now, Gibson. Hi, Gibson. <laughs> um, you don't, you don't. You're starting a record company, and unlike most record companies, you are not dependent on it succeeding. It is a marketing tool for you that gives you room to get kind of weird with it, to get experimental, to do stuff that doesn't make sense necessarily on the books, but can be really great for marketing and building a legacy and things like that. Just something to think about. I don't know, man. I don't, I don't, I just don't, I don't see this happening. (laughs) Yeah, it's probably not going to happen. We're just going to, we're going to get three EPs. One's going to be Slash, one's going to be Lizzie Hale, and one's going to be Joe Bonamassa, and (laughs) then it'll be over. (laughs) I mean, they might do. A, I, who knows? I, I'm just saying. Like, I understand why the why they're starting with Slash. I understand. Oh, why, sure. why They're doing that. Why wouldn't you? Uh, but I don't know. I it motive. I think it would be. I think whatever their second release is is really what's going to be the uh, set the tone. Set the tone. It's going to be the bellwether. You know, for the direction that they're headed. Or they should do some really unexpected stuff. Like they, you know how in the seventies and the eighties, there were just like all these records you could buy that were like country done on a Moog. Like, Oh yeah. They yeah. should put out a bunch of stuff. Like, Hey, this was recorded in the Gibson studios. And it's like, why, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> like just all cover songs recorded on, you know, some odd instrument. Their like fifth album is going to be, um, it's going to be another slash album, but it's going to be slash doing, Les Paul and Mary Kay no, covers. No, it's going to be Slash, but it's going to be all spoken word. <laughs> it's going to be poetry. Jeez. <laughs> Gibson put out a spoken word record. Oh, my gosh. It's all it's like poetry from Guitar Stars. Do crazy weird stuff, Gibson. They're not going to do crazy do weird crazy stuff. Do crazy weird stuff. I will be so excited. If they do some crazy weird stuff. Yeah, they're not going to do crazy weird stuff. I dare you. I dare, I dare you, Gibson. I dare, I dare you. I double dog dare yeah. you. <laughs> you throw like a girl. All right. Do we want to move on? <laughs> I don't have anything else for this. Man. Yeah, me so either. Let's, let's I mean, I hope I hope they use it as a, as a force for good in music. And I hope it's not just a, a separate way to allow well-known musicians to record another album that they could have recorded anywhere. Like, I hope right. they, they have the opportunity to use it in a way that other studios aren't releasing work. So I hope that they realize that and, uh, you know, utilize it. All right. First ad. Yeah. Let's get to this first ad. This was sent by Mark De Bruyne. De Bruyne. He's uh, in the two hundreds now. Oh my gosh, yeah, he's been listening through every single podcast episode and commenting on every single one. So we get to see his progress as he goes. He's, he's really, uh, you know, this item, I would say that this, uh, this is a Fender Japan guitar. He did some extra work on this because he translated the ad yeah, from he always, Dutch. Yeah, he always translates them. Should I read it in Dutch? Yeah, give it a shot. Ik heb u ert des a Fender Stratocaster made in Japan verkoot. Four or five jar gelden, zonder kofer, je bent deze komen testen in uk jakot, in durn antwerpen. Hey, that's Antwerp. I know that. De kleur is name, name lick, apple, <laughs> apple blah, ze groen die ik zelf gespoten heb. Grog will ik des trug overnemen Indian we tote in. Accord Zolden Komen. De Reda is Doc. Steve, it. Steve, stop. You've opened oh, a portal. <laughs> St- 
Stop! We did Steve! Cast have Demons gone. are coming through! <laughs> <laughs> Dimet, Desi, Guitar, Zine, Op and Domain. Nicto, Barato. Plankin, <laughs> Ignore, Vershillen, Indian, <laughs> Indian, you zitch here in Herkin. Neem, Don, even Contact, Ob. Uh, Vrandalike, Groten, Patrick. <laughs> so this says, Dear, bl- Dear Nobody. It just says, Dear. Doesn't remember the name. It probably means like greetings. Yeah. The translation is um, greetings or something like that. I once told you this Fender Stratocaster. I once sold you this Fender Stratocaster made in Japan four or five years ago without case. Oh, Zonder Kof- Koffer is case. Okay. Ah. Uh, you came over to try it and bought it in Duren, Antwerp. The finish is a turquoise that I sprayed myself. I'd like to buy this guitar back from you if we can come to an agreement. The reason is that I revisited old recordings that were made with this guitar and sounds can differ enormously. If you recognize yourself in this, then contact me, please. Uh, um, you know, I feel like this is is a pretty, I mean, I don't know. I guess I've lived in the same place for four or five years. So if somebody wanted to find something that they sold to me, um, then maybe it would eventually, if they got lucky and I happened to be on Craigslist, they could, Well, I, I could find it. I mean, if you keep all your emails, you could go back. Not if you do use Craigslist because Craigslist uses, oh, yeah. uh, they uses use expiring. like a short term yeah. expiring. But a lot but of people, I, a lot of like people. Over, I feel like overall, this is a, this is a, this is going to be a tough find on a, on a, you know, then I mean, the nice thing about it is a refinished Japanese fender is a pretty niche item. Right. So I, I think um, if he runs this ad for long enough, there's a good chance if that person still lives in the same area, they yeah, will see it eventually. Yeah. Because you know how we are, guitarists, we're constantly cruising the used listings. Yeah, and like I said, it, it's it's this particular like it, this is unique. It's 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 what it is. It is pretty like think about that concept though. Like I've sold so many guitars and so many pedals and amps over the years. Mm-hmm. Like, imagine if one day I woke up in a cold sweat and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I sold that. Like, that was my signature tone on this recording and I need to reproduce it or I just want to have it back in my life. Do you have a guitar? Do you have any guitars that you feel like would fit into that sort of Like, if I ever sold the Hallmark or something like that, like, I w- might need to track it down again after that. Or I would just buy another one. But... Like, imagine that scenario and, like, being in a, in a position where, like, I just want that guitar back. I want the way that guitar feels. I want the way that guitar sounds. Like, I keep buying other guitars and I keep thinking about that other one. Like, that's, like, kind of a nightmare scenario, right? Yeah. Like, you can never recapture that vibe of the guitar that you sold off because you needed $400 one day, you know? I kind of hope he finds it. But I also kind of hope that when he does find it, the person selling it gets a good amount of money out of it. Like at this point, at this point, like it might have been bought and sold three more times. So the person who sees this listing will be like, well, I have that guitar, but I didn't buy it from this dude. Yeah. I bought it last yeah. week. It sounds like he really wants it. I wonder what he'd pay for it. He doesn't have a price here listed. And he does say. Um, he does say Grog Wiltic Desertur Overnan Indian We Tote in Accord Zulden Coleman. He did say that. So I mean he's on the record. Yep. <laughs> but, I mean I think I think you know he's he's definitely open. He's definitely yeah. open to figuring something out. Do you think this guy will go double value to get his his special sacred guitar if back? If he sold this five years ago, I mean he might have to. It might <laughs> it's probably I mean, I think you've got to be prepared to pay at least a little more. Well, I think like this is a situation where you are offering to buy a guitar that someone else is not selling. Right. I I mean this guitar is Zonder Koffer, so that does it is Zonder Koffer lower the value a little bit. Right. Right. I mean it is Zonder Koffer. You have to take Zonder Koffer into account. Yeah. I don't actually know what that word. That means. was without without case. Oh, without case. Yeah. yeah. But I yeah. mean he sold it without case. So right. Right. Maybe it, the guy who has it now bought a case. Right. And he's like, I will sell it to you with Koffer. Yeah. Koffer included. Coffer is the case word, right? Uh, Zonder is without. I presumably yes. Zonder is a fun word for without. Yeah. Oh man, I'm totally Zonder food. Let's go get some food. <laughs> Zonder. Zonder is a fun word. Oh boy. This is Dutch. 
I yeah, I believe so. Yeah, he says, I'm already looking forward to hearing Steve attempt to read the ad in Dutch. I'm a little the Dutch. The wording is a bit strange, but when he writes that sounds, well, when he writes that sounds can differ enormously. I guess he means he's been trying to replicate the sound right, right. he got from his old guitar, but that he's been able to find a guitar that sounds quite the same. Maybe I should learn Dutch. Then you could read these ads accurately. I know, right? Mark wouldn't have to translate them for us. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I'm going to dedicate my life to learning Dutch for no reason. Stranger things. All have right. Happened. Uh, what's new, dude? Uh, what's new is we need to do a sponsor spot for bigger pedals. I knew it was going to go that way. Bigger but pedals. Grab that other one. I will. Grab that other one there. You made this, Ryan. You made. I this didn't with... make it. I I helped assemble it. You assembled this. Grant guided me in assembling this while I was at Nashville. I went to his house. There are two of these. There's, are there only two? There, I'm assuming there are nine that people will nine. be able to buy. Dang. You have one, well, I have I one, and I have one that's in pieces, and there's nine more. And there's nine more. So right. there's So there's three. There's 12 total in existence. There's 12 totals. There's three. Between the two of us, there are three of them. Right. And there are nine more. And I think I'm going to sell the kit or I'm going to assemble the kit and do a giveaway with oh, it that'd or something be cool. like that. Uh, yeah, the Stevis and Burkhead. It's got art on there by Karen from Big Ear. And I didn't even realize it. Uh, they were like, oh, man, we, we, you know, Karen made this. And then you guys changed the cables around. So now it's all wrong. For a while, we had I switched the cables. I switched a black one in. We're back now. We have the right cables now. She made the cable patterns. Oh my gosh, I never noticed that. That's yeah, wild. It's such a tiny little detail. Like one, <laughs> it's got my stripey cable and it's got your orange cable. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> like what a detail to like nitpick over. We need to get a pink couch in here. <laughs> I know, right? That'd be pretty cool. If we ever were, if we were ever pulling enough money in from uh from what we're doing here, then we would go get a warehouse space and build a yeah. set. And totally podcast on a peach on a pink couch like this. Yeah, I mean, I would blend into it. <laughs> you just have to wear color. <laughs> Maybe we'd have two different chairs. You get the pink chair, and I'll get like there a blue go. chair there or something go. like that. Yeah, that would be fun. I wish you know it's never going to happen. We're never going to be able to pull enough money. I mean, anytime I say never, it's like things end up happening eventually. But like, I can't see us actually being able to afford. What if this podcast was distributed by Gibson Records? <laughs> Gibson Records, put podcasts on vinyl. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's the worst idea. <laughs> that's am I, a, am the I, last thing anyone needs is podcasts it might, dedicated it to might vinyl. Not be. There's, I bet there's Unless. a market for that. I bet. Yeah, I, I can almost guarantee you that, like, somebody out there is like, you know what? I wish I had, man. Joe Rogan interviewing Elon <laughs> my Musk favorite on episode vinyl. episode on vinyl. Like, oh could gosh. you imagine buying like, <sighs> if you figure, it's like. It's there, just, podcasts just sound better on vinyl, man. There, there are definitely. It's because it's analog, you know? There are definitely, uh, there's definitely a niche for it. Like if you had some podcast that was like really, really good, that's like super famous. Like, imagine, You know what? You know what? If, I, if I was Mark Marin, if I was Mark Marin, there'd probably be like five or six episodes where I'd be like, I'm getting this committed to vinyl. Like Mark Maron, inter didn't he interview Obama? He did. Like Mark Maron interviewing Obama on vinyl. Or like, I know they always say like, don't listen to the first hundred episodes. So like Mabim Bam episode 101 on vinyl, I guarantee you they people mm. would buy that. Guaranteed. 60 Cycle Hum episode, one. which one was the one where we drank a lot and it was at Tiger Tiger? Oh, I think that was episode 200? 200, or was it just the two year no, that was 200. It was episode 200. That wasn't an especially... None of our episodes are especially good, but yeah. that one was not especially, especially good either. Bad. Right. I don't want to say it's especially bad either. 60 like, Cycle Hum Summer Nam episode. Oh my gosh. You put episode one on side A, episode two on side B. Here's what B. I want. I want to put... I want to put uh, a demo on nine millimeter reels. Dude. Okay. I got it. <laughs> and you have to play it through a reel to reel and you have to have the little uh, amplifier thing connected to it. For, for and you have to change the reel this, in the middle. This whole time we've been thinking about um, uh, 45s, right? It's 45 is the big one. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is release episodes on, on a uh, 33. <laughs> Just the little like highlight the, reels the, the no just the little like record singles 
Here's like, what no not, this is nine inch vinyl. This is what we need to do. We need to put out like the storybook companion style vinyl. Mm-hmm. That's like it comes with a book and like you hear the chime and you turn the page, but it's just pages of Craigslist ads. <laughs> <laughs> that that could actually work. We t- if you took an ep- if you took like a a set of like ads, if we just recorded a bunch of ads, like say twelve ads. Oh my gosh! And we had like, a, on, had like a, little pam- had a little pamphlet that we sell with the record. Oh, this is such nonsense! But put it on cassette tape and make a Ryan and Steve Ruxpin. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> hey there, boys and girls. Let me tell you the story of Craigslist guitars. Man, this went off the rails. Guys, go to BigEarPedals.com. <laughs> oh, we're still in a sponsorship. <laughs> uh, get on the mailing list because I was going to say, if you're interested in this, I don't know what the best way to, to find out more. They're hauling ass over there but to I'm keep saying- making pedals like to fulfill demand so you want to be on the mailing list you want to be on their social media you want to know when stuff drops so but you I'm can saying grab like it this weirdness i oh, don't know yeah. if this will be mailing list it might just be on the group it might be on instagram i'm gonna on our instagram i'm gonna be publishing his instagram the video Karen's this instagram i'm gonna be publishing the video this week for the stevis and burkhead and i would bet money that they're gonna sell out the it's moment, a drive pedal right the moment the video goes up yeah it's like an, it's an old drive it's his luck drive that was like a like a Kind of like a low run pedal for a right, like a uh, what is it, a festival that happened, yeah. But you're really you're paying for the art, but it's actually a really fun uh, modified tube screamer. It doesn't sound fizzy and light the way most tube screamers do, it's, it's the kind of a distortion, honestly. Mm. It's an overdrive distortion, cool. It sounds cool. All right, what's new, Steve? Uh, what's new is see, man, this whole like not quite two minutes thing is throwing me off. Oh my gosh, 26 30. Relax. Um, I don't want to listen to the episode later. I just want to write down numbers. People uh, are riveted by this I conversation. I bought an HX Stomp. Oh, yeah, you did. I bought the white one. I bought it from Doug Chris from 37 FX. Nice. Um, and some other. And, uh, yeah, so I have it, and it's in a box. I got it, and I opened the box. The box was, like, kicked in. Uh-oh. Uh, so, but because it was inside, it was, like, the original container, the original box inside of another box. Everything's in good shape. Yeah. I haven't used it yet, but I'm assuming it works. <laughs> when are you going to use it? Soon, I hope. Soon. He's going to use I it I got soon. to mess around with the Pod Go, and so I, you know, it's, uh, I'm just going to go all in now. I need to bring the Pod Go back to you. Yeah. Uh, but like, I, I mean, I don't know. Do we want to talk about my trip to the emergency room? If you want to. Uh, I went to the emergency room. I went to urgent care. Uh-huh. And I had a procedure done in urgent care, and it didn't work. Uh-oh. And so... Two days later, so that was on a Wednesday, and then on a Saturday, I went to urgent care again, and they're like, uh, yeah, you should just go to the ER because they have surgeons there, and those guys are going to know what's up. So I went to there, and um, they're like, oh, yeah, this is bad, and they're like, we can just do this here. We can just use local, uh, but first we need to do some, we need to, like, do some work and stuff. People are going to think this is a really serious situation. I mean, it was kind of serious. It was kind of serious, but like, I feel like you should give people some context. Uh, I couldn't sit down. I had a, I had a, a like a, an ab, they call it abscess mm-hmm. in my butt. Like, like people were going to think that you had like, Can't, like, like, like something or, bad. I mean, it's pretty I mean, bad. it's bad. It's bad. All things are bad that you have to get surgery for. Down. But people are going to be like, do we need to start a GoFundMe for Steve? I mean, you could. <laughs> you could start a GoFundMe for me, but it won't be for this. It'll just be like, it'll be a buy Steve a house in Southern California GoFundMe. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I am raising $750,000. Okay. Steve couldn't sit down and the emergency surgery fixed it. So now he can sit down. Well, the emergency surgery kind of fixed it, but then I still couldn't sit down. Like I could sit down for a few days and then I stopped being able to sit down. Uh, but now I can sit down again. It's so. not funny, but now that we're like lightly referencing what it is, it is it has become it's funny. It's funny in the context of discussing it to a platform of, of like r- a bunch of random people are going to know I had butt problems for like <laughs> two and a half weeks. Now it's funny. <laughs> um, when you call it butt problems, but, it, but it problems. becomes squarely funny. But it also sounds like it was very painful and upsetting. No, dude. It, well, do you remember like because I came over here like beforehand i was like yeah i don't know what's going on yeah um this is going to be the title of the episode forget gibson 
records. It's yeah. going to be Steve's butt problems. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had butt problems. I've never had to have surgery for them, but I've gone to the doctor for my butt problems. Like, I get it. No, this was, this was, this is real. My butt wife's problems. like, are you ready to have a vasectomy now? I'm like, I mean, it, I can't imagine it being worse. I mean, you were in there. You should have just asked for I one. I asked him. I was like, hey, can you guys throw in a two for one? And, <laughs> and, my, and my, the, the surgeon's like, he's like, oh man, I don't really know how to do that. I'm like, he's like, if you want me to just remove a testicle, I can do that. I was like, no, nah, I'm not ready to live that land. So <laughs> I love, I love that he's ready to just do that. Yeah, like, he, hey, I, I can give that a shot. I can just remove one. I was like, I'm pretty sure you got to remove both. Yeah, but he, he's, do I need to come back tomorrow and you can do the other one? Well, for, for a vasectomy, they don't remove either of them. No, but it would work if you removed both of I them. I mean, I guess, but then you'd have you'd other be problems. You'd I'm be pretty nutless. sure. Yeah. So Steve is Steve is feeling better now. I'm feeling better now. So you know that's wonderful. That's the moral of the story. Oh nope, there we go. <laughs> and now I can hopefully you know find some time to sit down and and plug in the HX stomp. Yeah, now that you can sit down, you can sit yeah. down and plug in the HX H- H- stomp. Exactly. Yeah. What's new with you, Ryan? I have been fiddling around with music theory. I've been dipping my toe in. Uh, I prefer music facts. <laughs> And I had a revelation recently Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about a piece of music theory tools Mm -hmm. that came from TikTok, believe it or not. I learned something watching TikTok, which is kind of incredible because that's not what you think of when you think of TikTok. Um, I joined. What do you think of when you think of TikTok? Tweens dancing. Um, (laughs) I I joined TikTok the first time. Like a year and a half ago, I think it's actually illegal. I think it's against uh, Copa to be a probably tween on TikTok. But anyways, I joined <laughs> a year and a half ago as like, wow, this is not for me in its current state. Mm-hmm. And so after like a week or two, I just like deleted the app. Like I'm done. This is not is not useful to me. I'll be back later. I'll check it back every now and then. Okay. So I checked back probably like four months ago, three months ago. And it's a lot better now. There's a lot more content out there. And the algorithm actually does a really interesting job if you spend some time on there of matching you up with stuff that you actually are yeah. interested in. Yeah. As long as you are smart about what you stop and look at and like and stuff like that. Like you have to kind of take control of your activity on there to get what you want out of it. Um, it's, I, I will say I don't feel like there's an algorithm for live streams. Right. Um, I only get like stupid stuff. I never check stream. out the live streams anyways, but I was cruising around. Okay. Thumb through. And, uh, I think he's a base channel. I forget which channel he Davey is. Davey 504. It's not Davey. It's this other guy. Patrick Hunter. No, I don't know who it is. If I knew if I, if it was those people, I would know who it was. Uh, and he's like, my least favorite thing about music theory is that, Everyone who teaches it tries to overcomplicate it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, this guy's got my ear. Mm-hmm. And he's like, like, here's the wheel of fifths. And he puts it up. And you're like, yeah, I've seen that before. I don't know what to do with it. He's like, everyone would be able to understand this if every music teacher out there just told you, oh, you just grab this chunk of six notes anywhere on the wheel. Like, it's a cluster of them. And that is 80% of the songs in the world. That grouping okay. of six notes in the position of the wheel and you can rotate that position around i was like wait a minute and so i go and i pull up the wheel of this and i start playing around with it i'm like holy hell he's right like 80 percent of the songs that i know how to play are in that cluster of six notes that just sit next to each other anywhere around the wheel mm-hmm. and then the songs that don't light up on on that suck no they're doing really fun <laughs> interesting things oh. and it's kind of like this realization that most songs can w- work within this wheel in different ways, which means that you can look at this wheel and use it as a guide to try stuff. Mm-hmm. And it gives you boundaries to cross. Like you can start with that grouping of six and be like, okay, I can play all these songs with it. But what if I went crazy and I split it in half and I wrote it, rotated to around to the other side. Right. Or what if I like grab that group of six and I just want to throw in something weird and I make it work like it gives you a rule to break, which is where creativity comes from Mm -hmm. is breaking rules. But you have to know the rules to break them, which is kind of the fun I've been having with the little bit of theory I've been picking up is like people 
like it's a common thing on the internet for people to be like, oh, if you learn theory, you're going to lose all your feel. You're going right. to like lose creativity and stuff like that. No, I feel like knowing where the rules are and pushing against them is where the real creativity is. And I think like learning that little bit of theory has been opening me up to new ideas in a way that I really appreciate. And I'm not like bogging myself down with like book learning, sitting there and studying so that I can talk like Rick Beato or something like that. Like, like being able to look at the wheel of fists and be like, here's a cluster that I know will work. Let's find something that will be weird to contrast against it. Like that's fun. sounds like something for you. That's that fun. Would, that would be good for you to add to how to make money off of YouTube version 6.9. <laughs> Yeah, how to make music, how to make a living playing guitar when you suck at guitar. That's what it's called. The sixth version, point nine. Yeah. But anyways, I that's what's new for me. That's cool. That's, yeah. That's a fun one. I'll put up the, I, I probably already did. I'll put up the wheel up here <laughs> so you can understand what the hell I'm the talking wheel about. wheel of pedals. <laughs> it's fun. It's really neat. Have you ever messed around with the wheel of fifths? No. You should try it the now. The circle of fifths. The circle of fifths. The wheel of circle. Wheel of wheel the of circle. Of wheel. Yeah, circle a wheel of fifths. I don't even know what it's called, and I'm using it. The circle of wheel. I honestly the, want to like the fifths of fifths. I want to draw it on the wall like a crazy person over here, so I can always see it, like in in like blood or something like that. Here it is. Oh my the god. The wheel. Uh, the all knowing wheel. <laughs> oh, here's a dumb. What's new for everyone to hate? Lay it on me, man. I've watched Fight Club for the first time. You're a changed man now, aren't you? Um, now which, which type of fight club viewer are you? Are you the person that's like, yeah, never talk about fight club. I'm going to, I'm going to start like meeting up with people to do this. Are you like, well, so, oh, okay. wow, this is like a, this is a criticism of masculinity so in it, the Western it world. It didn't help that your butt hurt. No, no, no. I, wa I watched this after my butt hurt. <laughs> after my butt was done hurting. Um, I, you butt uh, hurt, bro. <laughs> I was <laughs> real bad. <laughs> Turns out like constipation is not a joke. Ooh, no kidding. Yikes. Cause that was like the core of it. They're like, they're like, you should be feeling better now. I'm like, I don't. They're like, when's the last time you pooped? And I was like, I don't know, like 36 hours ago. They're like, mm. you need to poop. They're like, that might, that like, just keep taking these laxatives. You'll get there. All right. Talk about fight club now. So uh, <laughs> I, I kind of, I don't want to say it was dumb. You can spoil it, Steve. It's been out for 20 years So now. Okay. I think maybe if I didn't know what was like, I didn't know sure. the twist. Right. If I didn't know he was already dead the whole time and that the village is actually in the middle of modern day Pennsylvania or whatever, right, right, right. Uh, it would have been a better movie. Um, but at the same time, like, I also feel like, I think that if I was seeing it for the first time without knowing very much about it, I would have figured out like oh, sure. within the first 30 or 45 minutes, like, sure. Mm, this is, this is all. I don't think that the twist is the thing that most people had their mind blown. So by I, with, I think it was more like, I, it really is this phenomenon of different types of people watching it. Right. And, some of them getting the intention of the original source material and the intention of the director and actors and whatnot to be a criticism of that kind of ma masculinity. So I definitely, and so then my, the other side of it is people who are like, want to embrace that fictional lifestyle. Right. And, and so I kind of felt grossed out. Like I didn't really get, I didn't feel like the film very much gets into if I would say maybe the book is different. I have heard I, I, cause I was reading about it afterwards. I'm like, why did I feel like this movie's dumb? Um, I thought it was, you know, I thought like, Oh, this is like, there are a lot of neat art scenes and I like the breaking of the fourth wall kind of stuff. Right. Um, I kind of, I like that in movies, but it also just felt like really pandering and not fun. Like yeah. I didn't have fun watching it. Mm. And I'm not saying like you have to have fun. I'm not saying like, I don't mean I didn't, I don't mean. I'm going to disagree with you. I find it to be a very fun movie. It's got a lot of fun elements. I mean, I mean, it's, they're kind of, they're rough for fun. You have to have a really dark sense of humor, which I think you do have. No, I, I, I think I do as well. I think there were just, I didn't get the, I didn't feel like the film is particularly effective at criticizing 
commercialism. Oh, sure. Um, which and I, know I think that that's, that's the biggest. That's supposed to be one of the takeaways. Yeah. So, and then, then, so the only thing that I'm left with is knowing the kind of people that I knew who hyped this up were like 17 year old white dudes in 1999. And, um, and so the only thing I kind of felt walking away from it was, was like really cringy because mm. I was like, I know the people who were like, I knew dudes who were like, Oh man, like I just like who just wanted to like bare knuckle box, right? You know, randomly in the early two thousands, and I'm just so I just I don't know, like, yeah. Like I like I understand it, and it doesn't help. Uh, I was talking to uh, someone um, about it, your and therapist, it, it, and it, yeah, um, it doesn't help that I know that I'm all re- like as a person, I'm pretty. I always feel pretty hype averse. Which probably hasn't helped. It's, which mm. is probably part of the reason that I've never seen Fight Club. Right. Like, is that I've just kind of like not really cared. Yeah. I mean, I was I was hyperverse to the Matrix. Like, I didn't watch the Matrix until like Matrix the, is great. the first sequel came out. Oh, the Matrix sequel sucked. Well, the thing is, I waited so long to watch the first one that by the time I watched it, I was like, oh yeah, this is a fun movie. Like, it didn't blow me away or anything. But I was like, yeah. oh, this is really fun. I'm, I'm glad that I watched this. And then when the sequel came out. I was already like I hadn't built it up to be anything bigger than that mm-hmm. in my mind. So when the sequels came out, I was like, "Oh, these are fun movies too." I, this is not my religion, so I don't like. It's not breaking my heart no, in any I, direction. You know, I didn't like this. I uh, the second one um, I thought was the first. Now I've I have rewatched the sequels. I think like a year and a half ago, two years ago, something like that. And I was like, "Whoa, yeah, these were rough." <laughs> yeah the the first one I think still holds up. I mean, the CGI it, it doesn't hold sure, up. Sure, but, but the, it, I think the movie holds up. It and captures I, a vibe that that really works. I think the I think the the like philosophy of the Matrix is broad enough that it's still like a pretty fun like that. So the Matrix, like I'm saying, like the philosophy of the Matrix, the movie, the Matrix is fun because it's the Matrix. Uh, but I think the philosophy of the matrix is also fun. And I think that's part of fight club where it's like, okay, the fighting and the chaos of it all is, is fun. But like every time, every time like, uh, Tyler Durden says something, I'm like, are you a libertarian? Is that the point? Of, <laughs> is that the point of all of this is no, like, it's, you're, a, you're an anarchist. Fight club is that being said, an I, entire movie of, I'm 14 and this is deep. Yeah. So that, I mean, that being so, I mean, but the matrix kind of is too. Yeah. But I think they're deep in different ways because I think the matrix is deep within the concept of its own universe. Whereas the fight club is based in our universe. So the only way the concepts are deep is if you, which again, this is 2021 and we are in a housing crisis. So maybe destroying the 12, uh, the 12 largest corporations is the only way to correct the housing market. I'm not ruling it out. I mean, That's all I'm saying, I will say there is something fun about the idea of destroying corporate art. And I, Oh, the part, I, the part where they thought, yeah, that was fun. I would that one very much enjoy doing that to very many pieces of corporate art. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> How do they keep the freaking bean in Chicago so shiny? Like, I can't, I can't imagine that thing. I, I can't I know, believe right? that thing hasn't been destroyed by now. Like, you, you know, chrome, like, gets tarnished all the time on all sorts of materials. There's got to be so, someone. Like, how who, do they keep it shiny? Is it, is maybe it's just highly polished steel. And so every time it gets messed up, someone gets out there with a giant buffing wheel and they're able yeah, to just I buff it know. out. Because yeah. if it was chromed, it would eventually flake away. You know what? If I, I want to, you know what I want to do. That's what it's got. It's got to be a raw metal that they can that they can. I buff. want to get a can of Vanta Black, <laughs> oh my God. and just throw it on the Chicago stupid bean, because they're owned by the same guy, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What next? The we sponsorship. Gotta, we got to do. A, no, we got to talk about extrasensory perception. ESP. Yeah. Oh, that guitar. Yeah. This is going to be a long episode. You might have to skip the last 40. I think we should do a sponsorship. Dude, we just did a sponsorship before we talked about all of this new stuff. All right. All right. All right. You really want to do a sponsorship? No, no, that's fine. We'll do do, a chase list. We'll, We'll come back to you. Don't worry. This is for an ESP guitar that might not actually be an ESP guitar. 
And the seller was sent by Daniel Esporma knows that it might not be an ESP good uh, in ESP guitar. Yeah, he says ESP Eclipse condition is used shipped with USPS priority mail. I've owned it for several years and don't know a lot about it. A couple of years ago, I tried to get a hold of ESP uh, offices in Japan and see if they could track down the specific guitar just so I could verify its history. After multiple attempts, several runarounds, and a story about some warehouse possibly including. Some documentation burning down. I gave up. It could be a genuine Japanese ESP or it could be a fake. I really have no idea. It plays smooth, feels good, and is incredibly detailed with Grover tuning knobs, a serial number, and engravings on the neck. I have honestly done a ton of research and cannot find out its history, but whatever it is, it's a real gem of a guitar with the looks and three humbucker pickups and all. It's it's weird to me that... There would be a fake of this, Mm -hmm. but it also kind of tracks because you see like ads come up for, you know, like AliExpress guitars and stuff like that that come in configurations that you've never seen before on classic instruments. I'm not calling an ESP Eclipse classic necessarily. I, I think it's notable, but I've never seen one with three humbucker sized emgs in it before especially yeah. not in this very pretty plum color like it's a looker like i get why someone would want this and i have that uh that green river guitar which is that tiny little les ball that i gave to josh scott that was an esp build yeah uh and it was fantastic so i don't doubt that if this is a real sp esp that it is a fantastic guitar mm-hmm. but there is this tinge of doubt in me the same way there is in the seller himself, whether or not this is a real ESP well, just because it's like kind of a funky loadout. I threw this up and I found a purple one. That's not the same purple as this on AliExpress. on AliExpress. Whoa. Um, send me a, like a, send me the link to that. If you can, these are Grover style tuners. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. Like that, maybe that's what it is. I'm trying to show me the front of the guitar. Can't get a good zoom in on the logo. I want to see the front of the guitar. I think those are EMGs too. A different knob layout. It does have a different knob layout. I did notice that. Uh, Also different uh, finish because this has a gloss finish. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I know it's a different finish. Uh, it also might have a different body carve. This doesn't, I can't tell if it has, because it's a flatter finish on the, the Craigslist listing. It's hard if to it's tell. An, if it's an eclipse, it's a carved top for sure. That is very interesting. Same style inlays. But also, these import builders from AliExpress are known for using photos from the main brand. That's true. So they could, uh, these could be real photos that, and then uh, when you buy it, you're going to get something with three knobs instead of four. The neck heel looks the same. Does it have a, does it, does this one have a, this one has the, the body contour? Yeah. I would almost say, because this is on AliExpress, that they are using a photo of a real production guitar from ESP, which makes me think that this might be the real thing. <laughs> like, it's so hard to know. Oh my gosh. It's really like if ESP can't confirm the serial this number. This one says all my product are 100% same as photo. <laughs> so. Yeah, sure. Like I've seen AliExpress listers like use photos of clearly legitimate vintage Mose rights. And there's no freaking way. That's what you're going to get. Um, man, this is such a risk that was listed for 300 something on AliExpress. Three, three, 315. This guy is trying to get 560 for this. I don't know what the value of it would be if it was truly a Japanese ESP, but without being able to track down what it actually is, I need to see gut shots. Like open up, open up the, the the pickups and show the back of the pickups. Open up the control cavity to show the wiring and stuff like that. Like I want to see what's being used in this because that's a lot of times where fake imports fall apart. Yeah. Like I want to see the routing in it. 
Show us the batteries. It's, you know, Daniel found uh, photos of ESPs from similar years to compare serial numbers and to compare the logo print on the back, and he found differences. But I'm not convinced that those are necessarily an issue. Like, there could just be different stamps at each station or something like that. You see inconsistencies in all sorts of brands over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is a red flag. Before buying this, I would need more photos. And I would still probably be like, "Uh, I don't know about this. Will you take like 400? Yeah. At 400? At 400, if it's fake, you're out. Right, but at least you're not out 300. You know, you're out a hundred and that's gambling money. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. you're gambling whether or not this is the real deal or not. What do you think? Uh, trying to look at some more pictures still. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, one, I don't know that I would have even known enough about ESP to ask these questions. Sure. Um, I tend to just skip them. I, though I did this have lister. When this, I was trying to sell that that blue Stratocaster, uh, I did have people who were trying to sell me ESPs. Good on the person selling this, the lister, who are being like, "Hey, I don't know what's going on here." Like, good on them. They could have just listed it and been like, "Here it is. It says ESP on the headstock." Like, your guess is as good as mine. Like he he was very honest about that, and I I really. Uh, Admire that in this seller. It is a pretty looking guitar, though. It's totally not my style at all, but there's something really fun about that. All right. Sponsorship now? You know, I'm looking at other uh, pictures of other ESPs, and this might not even be the right hardware set for an ESP. doesn't matter. Someone who knows something about ESPs, look it up. Yeah, ESP experts. Hit us up. Tell us what's going on. Get in the comments section. All right. This episode is also brought to you by Chase Bliss Audio. I've got the Bliss Factory right here. I've got a handwritten serial number on the back, too. I know this is the real deal. It's not some sort of mystery ESB. It came from Chase Bliss Audio. It is a co- collaboration with Zvex. It's a, uh, it's a fuzz factory with all the dip switchy stuff on the back end there. Uh, I don't know when they're going to have a fresh run of these. I'm assuming someday in the future. It's a lot of fun. If you're a fan of the Fuzz Factory and you're a fan of Chase Bliss, I mean, that's a no-brainer. You want to get crazy controlling all those squeals and whines and oscillations or just dial in, you know, presets for a really traditional fuzz, you can do that too. Chase Bliss Audio, they make pedals more creative than you are, better looking too. They're (laughs) packed full of options, hundreds of thousands of various combinations across all those dip switches and all the MIDI like ridiculous and expression stuff you can do with these. If you know anything about pedals, you know that Chase Bliss Audio is a bonkers. Head on over to chaseblissaudio.com. That's probably Check the most out. professional sponsorship I've done in a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> I really earned it on that one. <laughs> Uh, let's do the last topic and then get the heck out of here. Yeah. So, um, uh, maybe a week or so ago, uh, the E8 people on the EHX mailing list got this crazy email about like very, amb- I wouldn't say it's crazy. I'd say it's very ambitious, definitely unexpected. I've, I've been trying to no, the, Steve, the I don't original- want to, I don't want to word shame you right now, but I've been trying to avoid crazy. It's been my little pet project. I've been trying to avoid that word. Okay. I've been trying to use other words mm-hmm, than mm-hmm. crazy. I use bonkers a lot. Okay. But like unexpected is a good word for this email. Well, the from, thing is, is that this email, the original email was, was kind of like nonsense. Right. Cause it's like, it's from EHX. You're expecting like, Oh, are they launching a new thing? Like they do like four times a year. No, it turns out it's this long email about how EHX is partnering with some scientist dude and they're going to try to find a way to harness the electricity, to harness the power of the magnetosphere, which is the gigantic bubble of magnetic electric energy that goes around the entire globe. 
and there's satellites involved somehow or something. And they're like, oh, we can't tell you how we're going to do it. This guy doesn't patent anything because he doesn't want people to know, but we're going to do this. Like, why are you telling us this? <laughs> I feel like this is a more a more rational take because the original email just said something like, there are 690 trillion joules of energy floating in space and we're going to get it. <laughs> and, and there's like no other explanation for it. Look out, space. We're coming for you. We're going to suck the energy out of you, space. I mean, it is it is a compelling concept and idea. And there's certainly... And then it's like, if you want to know more, go to ehx.com slash NASA. Like, that was the entire email. If there's plenty of people dicking around in space right now, getting ambitious, trying to figure stuff out, we've got plenty of satellites up there, that's for sure. So who knows? Maybe they have an idea on how to harness energy out of space or low orbit anyways. And it will revolutionize everything and all our power. We'll have free energy for the rest of humanity. Thanks to Mike Matthews. Yeah. So, so the whole concept itself is pretty wild, but basically one thing he talked about is, in order to launch anything into space, you have to use like massive amounts of fuel. And then it gets there and and now you're like stuck. And, and so um, one of the things that's, that's, you know, they talk about is like, well, maybe we can use, use fuel to launch more fuel into space. And this idea is like, well, we can just, you know, the idea is you're going to build these satellites that can harvest this like energy. Right. Um. And then use that for as like a refueling station, but also have these satellites that can, again, harness this energy and like be, shoot it down to earth to like a receiving station. That's something that like I was very, I read through one of the emails and I was vaguely understanding kind of the concept. It was like they want to use multiple satellites in different positions yeah. to, to alternate the fluctuation in the, the magnetosphere. So basically they're talking about AC power, but how do you get that fluctuation from one satellite to the other? And then down to earth, like the thought, like there's been ideas forever about harvesting energy in space and then beaming it down to earth, not beaming like star Trek. I mean like shooting like an energy beam, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a beam of light or radio waves, whatever down to a collector on earth and that just sounds like a super science disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Every time someone talks about that, I'm like, ooh. Oh, yeah. So this isn't even like solar wind. This is this is mag getting magnetic energy right. harnessed somehow that just that already exists because the Earth is spinning. <sighs> it's very Tesla-ish. Yeah. It's yeah. very like... And not like Elon Musk Tesla, like Tesla Tesla. Nikolai Tesla, like talking to pigeons Tesla. Yeah. Um, I mean, Nikolai Tesla had a lot of really brilliant revelations about electricity and the way that power works. And so, a, lot of his, mean, a lot of his ideas... Be, I'm not going to say they're unproven, but I'm going to say there's plenty of them that are like, okay, I'm not sure that this one really lines up with reality, Nikolai. <laughs> This kind of some of this kind of sounds like. Uh, um, did you ever play SimCity 2000? Yes. So of course in SimCity 2000, my concern with this whole thing, Mike Matthews, is the death ray from space. Is the death ray from space? Right. Like one of your options in there, but you know, is better than gives better energy than nuclear, uh, but not as good as fusion is microwave. Uh, but the problem with microwave is every once in a while, one of your satellites gets knocked and now you're just shooting microwave energy into, you know, nearby houses. Right. That's a problem. Like it, like it might not be this instantaneous death race for a scenario. And I highly doubt it would be, but what if it's like undetectable and every now and then this awful cancer ray, like is trying to refocus on the collector station and it, it, blasts you know like a whole community accidentally and you know 10 years later they're like how come everyone in this neighborhood has lymphoma now it's like yeah. oh thanks a lot ehx pedals 
<laughs> the big muff, big muffs gave my entire neighborhood lymphoma. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Like, I mean, that's, that's dark humor, but I mean, there's, there's a reason there is an incredible amount of energy in space and there's an incredible amount of energy just outside our atmosphere. Mm hmm. But the logistics of harnessing it and harvesting it are daunting. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, you can hope for a better future and hope that they're onto something. But it is a very strange email to get from a pedal manufacturer. <laughs> I mean, Mike Matthews still sells batteries with his face on them. Yeah, like he's jumping from nine volt batteries, which is. You know, technology we understand. Very old technology at this point to be like, oh, hey, you know what? Nine volts aren't good enough. We're going to harness, we're going to harness energy from space and we're going to beam it down onto the planet. It's a really cool idea. It's just like seems super, super Star Trek y. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, Star Trek is the future. I mean, so. Nikolai Tesla thought that we could find a way to just plug into the earth. Yeah. And yeah. just harvest free electricity out of the earth. And, if anyone wants to give that a try, there's no one that can stop you. I mean, he th seemed to think that he could do it. So if it is possible, someone out there can do it in their garage. So why aren't we doing that? You know, but I have a feeling the space thing is probably more viable than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it is interesting, you know, when I saw this in a lot of gear groups, you know, your Richard Branson's and your Elon's and your uh, Jeff Bezos is right of the world, you know, all three of them. You know, spending... I don't believe that 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 Bezos did go into space. I think it's all a hoax, uh, but I do believe that Branson went. Okay, yeah. Um, is that they spent all of this money to go into? Well, some people, you know, in both cases, because Branson went like fifty miles. I'm joking, by the way. Bezos went like sixty-two miles. Right, right. Uh, Mike Matthews wants to put these satellites at a thousand miles. Well, damn. Um, but one of the things that gets discussed is like you know these guys with all this money are just shooting themselves into space and kind of for the hell of it. Cause they're not doing anything there. And then they come back, I guess. I mean, I guess technically Why? it's like, I guess technically it's like proof of concept for, right. For trans, uh, orbital flight, like short time, short, whatever. Um, but then Mike Matthews comes out and, you know, probably not a billionaire. I'm assuming he's not a billionaire. No, there's no, um, he definitely doesn't dress like a billionaire. No, he's not building. He's not building um, his, his own rockets anytime soon. But he's coming up with these ideas that are like this. Even if it's this one crazy idea, that it actually is like globally beneficial. Right, and you know what? He's not. He's not a young pup. No. Like if this is an idea that has legs, and his company can put it into action, I mean, he's that's a legacy thing. Yeah. Like yeah. it'll it'll be a footnote in history. That he had pedals. Mm -hmm. And then the bigger article will be like, oh, he solved the world's energy needs with three satellites or something like yeah. that. You know, uh, like, I don't, good luck, Mike. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a cool idea. And I think the, I hope, the I hope you're successful. It's at least interesting. I hope you're successful and I hope you don't accidentally uh, vaporize anyone. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Let's do some housekeeping real housekeeping quick. Housekeeping and we'll and get out, out of here. Uh, housekeeping. Thanks everyone who supports us, uh, supports the show through Patreon, patreon.com. Uh, you can find us over there. We're 60 cycle hum cast. Just look for 60 cycle hum. Our logo will be there. It's obvious. Um, everything that comes through there, either it goes to us or it goes into the show. You know, it's, it's a way to keep the, the wheels greased. Uh, we, t we take a small salary out of it to cover, you know, the time that it takes us to record the podcast and to edit yeah. it. Um, the rest of it, the vast majority of it goes into the show. It goes into travel. It goes into equipment. It goes into costs that we have. It costs money to host the podcast. It costs yep. money to use the software that we use for live streaming when we do that and stuff like that. So there are costs that are covered by the Patreons. And honestly, at this point, we could not do the show without the Patreon. So huge thanks to everyone who is supporting us and will support us in the future. And there's no pressure to support indefinitely or even more than one month. You can do it one month and then say that was enough and you're done and you're out. And we appreciate it no matter how much you supported us at. So, yep. So uh, this this uh, week we uh, we got at the one dollar level. 
uh, or one euro or one pound level, whatever. Um, Steve Malum. How many shillings is that, Steve? Uh, I don't think shillings is a thing anymore. Andrew Davis and Kick Puncher 08. Kick Puncher 08? At the $5 level, we've got JS and Addison Cox. And at the ten dollar level, we've got Caleb Laws, well, who I just bunch. let into the inner. Well, it's been a while since we recorded. It's been a while. Uh, I just let Caleb Laws into the inner circle, and that's our little backstage group on Facebook where you can see uh, little. Li- well, it's Steve, a big it's group the now. biggest group on Facebook, as far as I'm concerned. Ooh. It's the only reason to be on Facebook. You know what I mean? I don't. Facebook's really gone downhill, hasn't it, guys? Oh my god. I mean, I don't want to get political, but come on. All right, so uh, this uh, I'm playing a song. I'm playing a song by Maddie Two Hats. Played a song SUV a while ago, and now we're gonna play his. Oh, this will be fun. One day hits. Oh, just kidding. This song's called Olivia. (laughs) Now it won't play because he stopped it. What? What in tarnation? Steve crashed his phone. That's very fun. It's not over yet. Oh my gosh, there's a lot left on it. Here we go. Here comes a reprise or something. Watch, it's just a minute of trails. It's going to be a secret track. I don't know. I think 
breakfast time. I think it's done. There's still time. I know there's still time on it, but I think it's done. I think it's just empty track. Gotta keep the faith. <laughs> like at this point, if it comes back as a full song, <laughs> as a full mix, it's going to be brilliant. It'll make me shit my pants. <laughs> Gross. No, dude, it's done. Oh, man. <laughs> Did me dirty. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. Stay grounded. <laughs>